All right, I might get started and people can join when they when they join. So hi everyone, thank you for coming. Hi Irene, thanks for messaging in the chat. Um, my name is Steph Lum, I'm from Australia and I'm the founder and editor of Youth and I. I'm also an intersex advocate, poet and a lawyer. And tonight I'm with two of my colleagues and friends who have helped me with this publication. Uh, so we have Georgia Andrews, wave, who's based in Wellington, New Zealand, and is our stakeholder manager. And George has been really instrumental in helping me with the um, upcoming issue um, of Youth and I. And we also have Gabby um, Niemeyer, who is our wonderful graphic designer for this upcoming issue and is also based in Melbourne, uh, like me. So I'm speaking tonight from Wurundjeri land and I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the Aboriginal elders of this land, past, present and emerging, and recognise that Indigenous land in Australia has never been ceded. I'd also like to thank Intersex Human Rights Australia for hosting us today and giving us the space to share about our work and also a big thanks to Ira for supporting the publication more broadly um, and helping us make it happen. So as a bit of an outline for today's session, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what Youth and I is and how the project came about and how we operate. And Georgia will talk for a little bit about intersex youth organizing generally. And Gabby will talk a little on the experience of being involved in this intersex project. And then we'll also share some of the entries from the first issue. And that one was published in 2019. We have a second issue coming out very soon. And we've only only just published today about the details for upcoming launch which is very exciting that will be held online on Thursday the 2nd of December um, at 6 p.m East Australian Eastern Daylight Time um, and I'll share the details of where you can register for that um, in the chat um, later since I don't have it on me um, but we'll, I'll pull that in at some point so you're all very welcome to attend that and um, with the added benefit that you can hear from the contributors themselves um, from around the world at that launch event. So feel free to ask any questions uh, or make any comments throughout this. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts about everything. Um, essentially, Youth and I, for those who don't know, it's an anthology of, of essays, poetry, drawings, cartoons, photography from young intersex people around the world. And issue one is freely available online as a PDF. And it's also available in some bookstores and libraries in Australia. And as of today, it's also available on our new website, which you can check out. And the new website also has the individual entries that you can access, which is amazing. Um, I'll share a link to our new website now. And so you can find, uh, you can find issue one. So when we're reading later, you can, you can follow along a bit more easily. So one of the really exciting things about Youth and I is that I think it's the only intersex publication that exists that focuses on the stories of young intersex people. And by that, we've bracketed the age at roughly 30 years and younger. And it's deliberately a space for us to share whatever we want about ourselves and our experiences in whatever way we want, really, as long as it can actually be published in print. So Youth and I first began in 2019 when I managed to get a grant from the Australian Capital Territory Government, which was looking to fund LGBTIQ projects. And I had this idea that I would ask young intersex writers and creatives from around the world to share their stories and importantly get paid to share their stories and publish it. I've often found in my advocacy work that we're often expected to share things about ourselves or we feel we need to anyway in order to be heard and be understood but often it can feel like we have to tell our story in a certain way to be understood or often if we talk to a journalist or write something our work and our words are edited and changed to to really tell a story that someone else wants to tell so what i really wanted to do with youth and i was create a space where intersex people could share what they wanted to and in, in the way that they wanted to and I work with contributors to edit their work and make sure that what is published, um, they've given the final okay to. And I focus on young people because there really isn't anything out there like that, not at least in Australia. 
and not that I've seen elsewhere in the world, um, that really just focuses on the experiences of young intersex people or creates a space for them. And Georgia will talk a little bit more about that um, a little bit later. But really, I think it's important that we create spaces for intersex people to share and con contribute to our community. Sometimes I think it can feel a bit overwhelming and intimidating to join an advocacy movement and not being sure what that involves or if you have the necessary skills for that kind of work. But I think, you know, it's important that we think about that advocacy can look like different things and it can look like sharing a personal account in a public anthology like this. Um, so youth and I is a really practical way to give voice to young intersex people and help them connect and be part of a community. So thanks to that initial grant, I was able to publish the first issue and from the proceeds from the sales of some of those books, as well as some donations, as well as now the support of Intersex Human Rights Australia, um, we've been able to bring together a second issue, which will be published in a few weeks. And it's been really positive to see who's using Youth and I. I've heard from different people that it's been included on reading lists in some university courses. It's been shared a lot amongst community. Um, and one really great outcome from the first issue was that the Victorian government's Department of Education and Training bought 100 copies of the first issue to use and share in their regional LGBTI training programs. So that's been really cool. I'm gonna pass now to Georgia to talk about intersex youth spaces more broadly. Thanks, Georgia. Thanks, Steph. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. I'm Georgia, my pronouns are she, her, and I've had the absolute pleasure of connecting with Steph for the issue two section of Youth and I as stakeholder manager. Uh, just a little bit of background about me. I am an independent intersex activist based here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, I've had former roles with Intersex Awareness New Zealand, Intersex Youth Aotearoa, and have worked in advisory positions for New Zealand government as well. Uh, but I'm just so excited to have this opportunity to work in a youth space, helping uplift youth voices. And I guess I wanted to touch a little bit on my experiences as an advocate and some observations I've made both leading up to this process and during publication uh, around what young people have been saying. I, I think there are a lot of challenges in finding safe and inclusive spaces for youth. And a lot of that is based around shame and secrecy. You know, unfortunately, we still have a medical model internationally that forms a narrative implying that intersex bodies are shameful. And so many of our young people, even newly diagnosed people in 2021 are put in positions where they don't feel like their bodies are worthy and they shouldn't be speaking out about their unique intersex identity. And that's, that's particularly unfortunate. And I, I think that for me personally, what's been really empowering about this process is I've been able to invest time in this space with Steph and with Gabby and with support from ERA to create spaces to celebrate other people's experiences. For young people, I think a lot of us come in, find community and are quite quickly absorbed into advocacy spaces where we often speak on behalf of other people and in some instances forget to talk about our own stories and other times don't find comfortable space to talk about our own stories. So Youth and I is celebrating the need and the benefit for young people of having spaces to be and to connect together. I also have observed through the time with Youth and I this year that we have young people who are geographically isolated spread across every continent in the world and we've had contributors from nearly every continent in the world um, apply to submit for issue two and it's not often that you see that where there is a global contribution to publication it's often segregated we'll often see bulk communications coming out of Europe or coming out of North America but very infrequently do we see such a broad range of viewpoints. And I, like Steph said, I don't think we've ever seen a youth publication of its kind like this, where we have such a broad, a broad space, a broad viewpoint. So I'm really excited to join you all this evening. Thank you for coming and um, to share some more stories soon. 
Thanks, Georgia. Yes, um, completely agree. And to that end, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the process of um, for youth and I, because I think that's just as important in many ways as the publication itself. Um, there are certain values that I really wanted to be carried out in the whole process of publication, um, from the initial planning to the final product. Um, throughout this, I've really wanted intersex people to be involved in as much of that process as possible. And I want intersex people to be paid, as I mentioned, but for me, why that's so important is because I want intersex people to know that their story is important and their work is important. Um, and I want them to know that what they create does have value. And of course it has value, even if it's not assigned financial value, but I want to emphasize that in a world where we talk in money, intersex people should be getting payment for their creative output. I also want everyone to be able to access the book, which is why it's freely available online. And now the individual entries are available online too. I want to help upskill intersex people in this process as well, to help intersex people go through this process of submitting a piece, having it edited, working with me on improving it and then publishing it. And I'm also learning about how to bring all of this together and out into the world. And I want the team of people I work with to also be able to build up their skills by being part of this project which is why it's so great and an improvement on issue one is to now be working with two other intersex people on this um, and I'm delighted for this upcoming issue to be working with Georgia who has done incredible work you know reaching out to different intersex organizations around the world and talking through this whole process with me as well as Gabby doing the graphic design work and to be able to give them the space and support to learn and refine our skills during this process. And it's been incredible to be able to give some work to intersex people. I think it's really important where we are able to help grow the skills of our community and continue to reinvest in each other and the work we do for each other. And another key thing I want with Youth and I is to break down those language barriers we see in the intersex movement. It's really difficult for intersex people who don't speak English to engage in a lot of international work and in international projects. Um, and yet it's those people who in some ways we need to hear just as much if not more from because we haven't been hearing from them. So that's why for this upcoming issue we really put a lot of work into translating our information into different languages um, and the, yeah, the information about how to submit into different languages as well as you know told them that they could uh, submit in whatever language they want and then we would work with translators to publish the their original text um, as well as the translation alongside each other so I wasn't really sure how much work that would take but we did it and I'm really excited that we did um, I think it's a really incredible development in our direction because it's so crucial to help engage more intersex people and to be able to learn from them um, and share more amazing works from around the world. So for this upcoming issue, we have had a number of submissions in Spanish and one in Polish, one in Italian and one in Indonesian. And we'll continue to try and reach out to other places and communities for further issues. Um, and we've also sought to engage intersex translators to do, that intersex, to do that translation work. And we were successful in that for most of the contributions, which I'm really pleased about as well. George is now going to talk briefly about some of the feedback she's been receiving in her role as stakeholder manager and the impact of youth and I more broadly. I have absolutely loved being stakeholder manager because I've seen so much excitement come through my inbox every day. The biggest impact that I've seen from contributors is the mere fact that they have space to be able to share their own personal stories and for space to be given for their story and their story alone to take space at a page, both online and in print, which is amazing. And a lot of our contributors have never had connections to intersex advocacy circles. Some haven't been directly involved with intersex organizations. So it's an emerging time for them to express themselves sometimes They've used pseudonyms to protect privacy, but we've helped create space where they felt safe to do that. And it's really lovely to see that it, it builds confidence in people that if, 
if their piece is accepted, that they feel valued and like they can contribute further in, in building community and connection, which is often hard to come by, particularly when you're a newly diagnosed intersex person. The other factor has been payment. So, so often, and many of you in the room who are intersex advocates will know we are often asked to contribute our, our stories, our trauma, our experiences, our training with no financial contribution that comes back to us. So every contributor who has had a piece accepted for issue two has been paid. And I, I think that really sets the standard for how how we should be working in intersex spaces when we are asking for intersex stories to be shared. And the, the um, young people that have contributed are very thankful to Intersex Human Rights Australia for their financial contribution, which has made that possible. Uh, but overall, we just have a bunch of excited people who can't wait to see our publication launched on the 2nd of December. Thanks, Georgia. I'm going to pass over to Gabby now to talk to us about some of her experiences being involved in the project. Thanks, Gabby. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not much of a talker. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm Gabby. Um, I'm an artist based in Nam, Melbourne. Um, and yeah, I've got some graphic design experience. I've done some freelancing uh, work before, um, but never on this scale. But it has been, uh, like Steph said, it just a really good opportunity to um, upskill my skills and, um, I don't know, contribute to such an amazing project. Um, I think it's, yeah, the more and more I work on it, the more I, like um, excited I get by all the stories that I'm reading and, and, and like, and sad too, and sort of just, happy that like this is happening and it's it's getting another issue and I really want to make sure that it it I do it justice um putting it together collating it working with Georgia and Steph to make sure that the order is really nice and cohesive and um each sort of story in terms of like graphics and stuff have like um a meaning to them sort of shine they each story shines in their uh, in their own light um, and yeah it's it's really exciting I've just it's um been tough work but it's like work that I'm really proud of and yeah it's so important as an artist um, I've always been for making sure that artists are paid right um, and I think maybe yeah it's just just another one of those things that you're you're really happy to work with people who want to support that and being an intersex person, it's, I don't know, even more special. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, very cool. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> Thanks, Gabby. Um, well, we're delighted to have you on board and um, you can check out Gabby's cool front cover for issue two online as well. So recommend checking that out. It looks incredible. Thanks. We're, sorry, we're going to share a couple of works from the first issue with you all and then um, yeah we'll have a bit of time at the end as well for questions um, or thoughts, reflections. Um, so you can follow along since you can access issue one at the link I shared but I'm also going to share it again because this is a more direct link to the issue one if you would find it. Um, yeah, so we'll just read a few few entries and um, then we can hear from all of you in a bit. So I will begin um, once I get it up and I'll be reading um, a poem by Gabriel Philpy, who is an, an intersex advocate based in Canberra. And the poem is called enter I, and the I has an asterisk, and the asterisk means intersex, which you can't hear when I read it. So you can imagine, um, or you can follow along, but I think it, it adds to the, uh, to the unknowingness by just hearing it fully. Enter I. 
Enter I into my life. I imagine I myself me in a world where I can be I. And I don't have to try to fit in places where I do not. I knew long before the words formed and breached and bathed in sunlight, exposed there to reap. Long before seeds were sown, the truth was always mine and I carried it, quiet. Sigh and cry and watch days go by, fall away, piece by piece. I, not yet something whole, but worn, a whole, torn with toward expectations of the child I was supposed to be. Fraught with fear and hope and beauty and radical self-love. Acceptance, only after odysseys, across landscapes of change and pills and pain, a chance at something better. Grasp between fingers, tight, firm and solid, for the first time, unlike the fine sand of yesterday that always slipped away. I took root and grew, forming something new. I, I exist beyond imagination. I am here and whole and I am realized. Enter I into my life, at this time, the right time. And now I see I was always me. Georgia, you're up. Thanks, Steph. Um, the piece that I am about to read, just bear with me a moment. Uh, the piece that I'm about to read is called If I'm at All Like a Flower uh, by Mari Roby. My body is intersex. And no, that does not mean that my body is broken, abnormal or diseased. Still, the context of my body has been defined and rewritten in and out of existence so many times that I don't know what it is or where I stand. They compare me to flowers, as if our reproductive systems and parts are the same, only what's in a name? If I am at all like flowers, it's only in what I, to get here, overcame. But how does one heal in a body that was surgically constructed to conform to pain? They whisper words about your future husband because the theoretical pleasure and existence of a man, your groom and of your own heterosexuality and submission is somehow more important than letting you bloom. The word necessary has all but lost its meaning, ringing through my ears used in a way that implies that the procedures and medications and treatments are unavoidable when my body was unbroken from the start. Unbroken. Like the mirror that reflects, there are no horns on my head or targets on my back. Like the picture, perfect definition of diversity that accepts red hair and green eyes as natural, beautiful, true, but not you who shares the same percentage, 2% of the population too. And for all its late night prime time recognition, the word intersex evokes the same amount of concern and confusion as a highway traveled upon so seldom that no one seems to understand it at all. Only those who do travel upon it write into their science books that hermaphrodites are small biological mistakes too rare to even bother discussing in much more than hushed voices and disgusted tones as if my body was nothing more than a biological exemption from its conception in their laboratories where I don't belong. But my body is whole, normal, natural. My body planted a garden inside me that reminds me that we are not as binary as they made us out to be. That if I'm like a flower, by any other name. It's in the fact that my body and my mind are vibrant and thriving and alive with the same refusal to be subjugated as dandelions growing through the cracks of concrete that say, you will not stop me from growing. So don't confuse me for someone on the outside looking in at the categories I have defied, wishing to be defined by just another check mark in a box. My body is intersex and my lips know it. So 
read them when I say, you can never hope to contain me, you cannot change me, and you do not know me better than I know myself. Gabby. I'm going to read from issue one. <laughs> uh, I Wish by Irene Kuzemko. Pro frugal tip, save money on therapy by becoming a famous inter intersex activist. Recently, I wanted to tell my intersex story to my therapist. Instead of paying for an entire session dedicated to telling my story, I just sent him links to my interviews and that was it. On a serious note, I'm so happy to have the opportunity to share my interviews with people instead of having to tell my story for the zillionth time. Just Google me, dude, seriously. In the beginning, when I had just discovered I am intersex, I wanted to tell my story to everyone. Nowadays, I'm so tired of telling it. Plus, it's so frustrating. Plus, it's just frustrating that we, intersex people, have to tell our stories all the time in order to validate our demands. We have to either experience our pain and trauma over and over again. Each time with it, we tell our story, or have to completely disassociate ourselves from the story and tell it mechanically without any emotional involvement. I do the latter. I've told my story so many times that I don't even feel anything anymore when I'm telling, when telling it. I have even had journalists complain to me that you're using the same exact words and sentences that you used in your previous interviews. And of course I am. I've told it too many times for it to be different to, to be different every time. Another time a news agency wanted to own the rights to my story, I asked, but what, but would I be able to still give interviews without consulting with you? And they replied, yes, but with another story. My response was, lol, I only have one story. I'm not doing this. Every time somebody asks me, what do I do? It means, that I have to give them an entire, uh, them an entire intersex 101, talk about human rights violations and tell a bit of my story and my activism. I hate lying and I'm happy that I'm able to be open and talk about being intersex to anyone I meet, whether it's, whether it's an Uber driver, a person in line next to me when boarding a plane or a random drunk person I started talking to at, in the club but it's so exhausting having to explain these things over and over again. I wish one day intersex awareness would, become, would come to a level that we won't have to explain to people what intersex is. Sometimes I feel that our work in, our, in my country is invisible. No matter how good our content is and how hard we try, we don't have much reach and very few allies. I wish more people paid attention to what we were saying, what we are saying and doing. If you Google intersex in my native language, Russian, uh, most of the results would be interviews with me and my colleagues and pictures and videos of me. I'm not complaining, but I wish more people in my country spoke about being intersex. I wish more journalists would educate themselves about intersex before interviewing me. I wish photographers would stop suggesting to me the idea of the idea of me looking very feminine in some shots and looking masculine or androgynous in others when taking photos of me to illustrate my interviews. I wish journalists would stop interviewing doctors along with me to put their opinion opposite mine in the same article. I wish more people educated themselves online on intersex issues instead of asking me, but what does it look like? And other inappropriate questions. There are so many resources out there created by me and my incredible colleagues from all over the world. I wish more people actually took the time to educate themselves in those resources, with those resources, or at least read a Wikipedia article. I also wish more allies consulted with us before doing something intersex related. Recently, I, I made this meme and it encapsulates my feelings so well. It's a photo of Jig Jigglypuff, me when I started doing intersex activism versus me now. 
There is a popular quote, find something you love to do and you'll never have to work a day in your life. I disagree. Intersex activism is my dream job, but it is still hard work and it is very tiring, but it still makes me incredibly happy. Otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. When a parent tells me that because of what they learned from me, they won't allow surgery to be performed on their intersex baby. Or when an intersex person I just met, just met hugs me and tells me I'm the very first, I'm the first person, uh, first intersex person they've ever met and their eyes sparkle with joy. These moments remind me why I'm doing this. Thanks Gabby. And I should note that we have the famous Irene Kazemko in the audience with us tonight, uh, who's kindly let us read her entry. And Irene's also contributed to issue two and will hopefully be um, sharing at our launch. All right, Georgia. Okay, this next piece is called Intersex by ITSH. I am caught in between, or rather, I exist there comfortably, wedged in, or rather, nestled right where I was born. Some don't see me as whole. Others see me as whole in their ideology. I break the factory flow. When it's time to sort me, they can't find where I go. Gender is energy, not created or destroyed, just felt. No, I am not lost. Truth is, my body can't be mapped. I remain the compass and the needle. Witness the North suffocating the South. I am a collection of poems that have yet to read themselves. I am an unchecked box. I am doubt's invitation. I am an uncomfortable truth at an unbearable volume. I am. The next piece I'm going to read is one of my own. And um, before I share it, I, I have really appreciated the opportunity to submit the piece two years ago, because on reflection, it's really shown the journey that I've taken, uh, not only as an advocate, but as an intersex person. And I think my, my perceptions of my, myself and my intersex diagnosis have Somewhat stayed the same, but there have been many changes as well. So it's definitely a, a reflective piece. Uh, it's called um, Beyond Pink and Blue. Pregnancy tests, ultrasounds, gender reveal parties, maternity shopping, childbirth. On the day we take our first breath, a clinician typically lifts us in the air does a speedy examination and pronounces our sex. At some hospitals, bright lights flash pink and blue on the street front to celebrate the birth of a new baby boy or girl. My parents welcomed me into the world in the 1990s. A month premature, I eventually escaped my incubator to be clothed in a pink hat and blanket before traveling home to a childhood of pink clothes and pink teddy bears. Fast forward 16 years to a new life at an all girls boarding school. My health started to deteriorate in year 12, beginning a long journey of medical tests. We eliminated the possibilities of epilepsy and brain cancer over many months. I returned to the specialist clinic for an emergency consultation and results revealed that despite my body being physically female, I was actually born with XY chromosomes. In a binary sense, cisgender females typically present with XX chromosomes, while cisgender males typically have XY chromosomes. To my shock, my doctor told me that I was not a normal woman, but my condition meant that I was infertile as I did not have ovaries and that I would never be permitted to complete in the Olympic Games and that I would never meet another intersex person in the world like me. Their parting comment was that my diagnosis and newfound infertility had to be kept a complete secret from everybody I knew. To them, I sat uncomfortably outside of binary gender norms. Several years later, after endless research, I learned that I was intersex. 
an umbrella term used to describe nearly 2% of a global population born with biological variations of sex characteristics, such as hormones, chromosomes, and or physical anatomy that cannot clearly be labeled under binary definitions of male or female bodies. In a sense, I see my body as sitting in the middle of a spectrum of human diversity. Intersex is often confused with transgender, which is traditionally used to describe people who were assigned a sex at birth and identify with a different gender identity. The I in the LGBTQIA plus rainbow acronym is often not well known. Very few members of the intersex community here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, feel comfortable being out as intersex, due to a sense of being outliers who hold shameful and unspeakable identities often influenced by conversations at diagnosis, like the one I had. Like all people, intersex people have diverse sexualities and gender identities, and many self-identify as members of the rainbow community. To me, an intersex presence in the rainbow acronym reflects the collective stand we, each, we take each day as a group of marginalized and underrepresented people wishing to stand up and fight for our basic human rights alongside other members of the rainbow community facing similar challenges. As a lesbian and intersex woman, I have faced two separate coming out events. Both of these situations have challenged ideas of what many people in society stereotypically perceive to be a normal woman. Our rainbow community sits within a beautifully diverse spectrum of sexualities, genders and sex characteristics. We are more than pink. We are more than blue. Let's not forget that. Yay. Thanks, Georgia. I'm so glad you decided to share your entry. Um, these were just some of the issue, the issue, yeah, entries for issue one. Um, we hope you enjoyed them. As I mentioned, issue two will be published soon on the 2nd of December and the link, which I now have is yeah, in the chat. And you'll hear a lot more from the contributors at the launch and much less from us. Like issue one, issue two will be published online for free as well. So I'm really excited about our next publication. It's looking really fantastic. The contributions are really beautifully told and Gabby has done a brilliant job at the graphic design and it just helps highlight how amazing all the contributions are. So we can't wait to share it with you. Um, it'll be, be around soon. So on that note, does anyone have any questions or comments um, to any or all of us? We're happy to chat for the next 15, 20 about anything. Thank you. Please fire away. We love questions. <laughs> the age bracket for contributions is 30 and younger. Um, yeah, well, we would love you to write in. We'll let you know when the next um, when the next issue will be. So I'm not I'm not sure. You know, I I hope it, this will be a regular, hopefully an annual publication. Um, but certainly, whenever we're looking to do issue three, we'll be yeah sharing it on all our socials and asking for contributions. And we would love to hear from you. <laughs> And please share with your friends. I think it's really important that we get the word out about you and I. A lot of people are only recently finding out about issue one. So share far, far and wide. So we'd love to have an even more diverse audience next time. Yeah, that's right. And even, you know, if you want to contribute and you're, you're um, older than 30, there may be other ways you can help, um, particularly with some of the translation work um, or, or other things. So... Yeah, we're keen to get people involved wherever possible. Thanks for your comment, Christine. I, I think um, having worked in advocacy spaces and education is such a lack of resources and it's great to be able to have that first person narrative 
in training environments. So I think the most important thing in training is that first person stories are shared because otherwise, you know, it's just theoretical nonsense in the eyes of a lot of educators um, and, and clinicians. So thank you. And yeah, we're really happy for you to share the link with anyone and everyone, all Pride workplaces. Um, certainly, we're also trying to make the imprint publication more widely accessible as well. But um, yes, that has its own challenges. But certainly in, in Canberra, um, you can borrow it pretty easily. And once we're able to sort out um, other ways that people can access the imprint, we'll be posting about that too but we would really love it you know if people were able to to buy the actual copy um just because it's it looks so good the physical copy of it but yeah we'll let you know bonnie do they get to do contributors get to hang out together in a special youth and i online utopia i mean this is it right here isn't it <laughs> But Bonnie, I think we could utilize your DJing skills for some exciting social space. So I know where you are. You'll be hearing from me. And that's certainly something we've been thinking about. And, you know, we should say as well, if anyone has thoughts on, on you know, what we could be doing differently or has ideas, we're really happy to hear from them. Um, We've been thinking about ways to try to create, yeah, kind of a, a space for youth that's not just these individual publications, but, um, you know, it's a difficult balance to find, um, yeah, what that might look like and, and how that can be sustained as well. And I think that's been the challenge, one of the challenges in the past. Um, but, yeah, I think things like the, the website development and having more of these kind of online events is at least some way towards that. But, yes, certainly always looking to find new ways to bring people together. Thank you for the love, uh, Irene and uh, Marita, for the, yeah, the love of the front cover. Isn't it stunning, Ro? I'm, I've just been telling everybody this week how beautiful the cover is. I just wanted to touch too on what um, Steph was saying around building connection with communities for people a focus area we've also had is making sure that we've connected with regional intersex organizations so that young people who may have contributed to issue two but don't currently have community connections are able to reach out and gain some support i think it's a you know a, a key responsibility when producing a publication that we make sure that there's pastoral care wrapped around the supports that we offer um, and young people being able to Enter and we're really grateful for the supports of the organisations that we've been in touch with. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you'll turn into a pumpkin after 30, Irene, so just let us know how that goes for you. <laughs> but, you know, like we did set 30 as a cutoff. It's just because we wanted to have a cutoff and talk about youth, but you know, we certainly are a little flexible and we want to help encourage people to be part of it in some way. So um, whether you're a pumpkin or not. So yeah, don't, don't run away as soon as you turn 30. Maybe an opportunity to create another magazine. Don't know. It's true. Wow, we, we do occasionally joke. Irene, Steph and I, but we are currently young dinosaurs and at one point will become old dinosaurs. So there might need to be a elderly dinosaurs publication produced in future for us. <laughs> yes, the intersex dinosaurs, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think there is a need in some ways for a publication for um for everyone um and a lot of people do message and ask if you know if 60 is counted as young um and you know it would be nice to be able to include everyone in some respects so yeah there's certainly potential out there to do future things like this 
Um, I think there's very much a, a want within the community for something like that. And I think there's that consideration too of, I think people have medicalized experiences of being in adolescent or pediatric healthcare and they suddenly hit the age of 18 and the medical complex throw them out into the world and say, you're a big kid now, go and look after yourself. And I've seen a little bit with youth organizing that quite often people get to 25, maybe up to 30, suddenly they're cut out of the youth category and where next? And we're all naturally getting older. You know, I'm 30 next year, so don't think I'll be quite allowed to call myself youth anymore, which is a scary thought. Um, but yeah, how do, how, do, how do we develop spaces moving forward so that we don't lose community just based off how old we are? Do we have any more questions? Well, we can wrap it up a bit early if no one has any more questions. But yeah, just always, you know, always feel free to shoot us a message, um, and we'd be really delighted to see you at the launch in a few weeks. And yeah, thank you so much for coming. We've really enjoyed tonight. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone, and thank you, Ira, for hosting. We really appreciate your support. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. See you. Well done, that was excellent. Thanks, Claire. Thank you so much.